In this section of our online course, we've been examining the science underpinning eFlows. So far, we've considered hydrology, hydraulics, and geomorphology. In this lecture, we'll consider the living organisms in river corridors, the connections between them, and hints about the relationships to flow regime. We'll focus squarely on flow ecology relationships in the next lecture. Humans are also very much part of the life of river corridors, but we've already considered ourselves and our interests in some detail in earlier lectures. So let's turn now our attention to other forms of life. We'll begin with the primary producers, which in most cases are those organisms that produce biomass from inorganic compounds in the process of photosynthesis. Using the energy of sunlight, these organisms combine carbon dioxide and water to produce organic matter and oxygen. Primary producers are the basal food source for food webs and are thus a critical source of energy for freshwater ecosystems. Among the primary producers, algae are single-celled plants that may grow as individual cells, in colonies, or joined end-to-end -end in filaments. Cyanobacteria are also primary producers with a special ability to fix nitrogen. This gives them an advantage in nitrogen-limited associations. Algae and cyanobacteria also grow in complex associations with other microbes in a slimy mass called paraphyton. Macrophytes are another group of primary producers. They're aquatic flowering plants that grow where substrate, nutrient, and water clarity conditions are right. They also provide habitat for other species, especially insects and algae. As important structural features in streams and rivers, macrophytes also influence river hydraulics, most commonly reducing flow velocities. As we learned in the last unit, velocity strongly influences the relative amount of erosion and deposition in a river reach. So by reducing velocities, macrophytes increase the deposition of sediments, thereby contributing to the creation of substrates they need themselves in a positive feedback mechanism. Riparian vegetation is a final group of primary producers important to stream and river corridors. Like algae and macrophytes, riparian trees, shrubs, and herbs are important basal food sources to aquatic ecosystems, providing energy in the form of leaves, branches, and trunks falling into rivers and streams. Riparian vegetation is also important for stabilizing river banks, providing habitat to a wide range of animal species. Riparian plants may also be of special value to humans, providing food, fiber, or medical compounds. If by chance you're not familiar with the term riparian zone, let me pause for a moment to say a word about this important element of river ecosystems. The riparian zone lies adjacent to freshwater bodies, including streams, rivers, and lakes. It includes floodplain areas, but the term is more commonly used for narrower zones of distinct vegetation, as you can see in the photos on this slide. Species inhabiting riparian zones are generally different from those further from the river channel. This is easy to see and understand in savanna systems like the Rio das Marches on the right, but even along the Mopan River in Belize, where the natural vegetation near and far from the river would be forest, the species are generally different. This is because, for all the benefits of having ready access to water, riparian zones are challenging environments for plants because they're frequently disturbed by floods. Also, continually high moisture levels are difficult for many plants to cope with. Riparian plants have special adaptations to allow them to live in the high moisture and high disturbance regimes that characterize riparian zones. These zones are also often referred to as buffer zones because they help to shield and protect streams and rivers from excess sediment and chemical runoff from the adjacent area, which may be intensely used for agriculture. I'll include more information in the additional resources folder for this unit. Returning to the different forms of life in river corridors, let's look at the decomposers. These consist mainly of bacteria and fungi that feed on other organisms that are already dead and decaying. Like the rest of organisms we'll discuss, they derive energy from the process of respiration, which is the reverse reaction to photosynthesis, combining organic matter and oxygen to liberate the energy of the sun and produce water and carbon dioxide. Bacteria and fungi can also reverse the photosynthesis process and break down organic matter using compounds other than oxygen, but we'll not worry about those for the moment. 
As the images on the slide show, decomposers colonize dead material they're decomposing, whether it be leaves, wood, or the flesh of dead animals. In the process of decomposing plant material, they also make it more palatable, that is, more easy to digest by insects and other organisms that also consume dead organic matter. Therefore, bacteria or fungi colonized organic matter is the preferred food source of some other organisms. Decomposing bacteria also form biofilms that coat organic detritus as well as rock surfaces. Moving into the animal kingdom, mollusks and crustaceans are common and widespread in freshwater systems. Freshwater mollusks are mainly snails and clams, and at least 5,000 different species rely on freshwater ecosystems. The snails colonize plant and rock surfaces, where they feed on paraphyton and biofilms. Clams are generally filter feeders and filter fine organic matter from the water column. Snails and clams are consumed by larger predators, including fish and riverine mammals. Crustaceans include shrimp, crabs, crayfish, and amphipods. Crustaceans are mainly omnivorous filterers and scavengers and are important in organic matter decomposition. They're also preyed upon by larger predators. Just a quick reminder about herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores. Herbivores eat plants, carnivores eat other animals, and omnivores eat both. Another highly diverse and functionally important group of aquatic animals are insects. The larval stages of many insects are aquatic and the adult stage terrestrial. This illustrates one of the many ecological linkages between aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. We'll look at this more uh, later in this lecture. A diverse insect community is critical to the healthy function of river corridors, as insects form an essential link in energy transfers from lower to higher trophic levels. Certain insect groups also serve as sensitive indicators of water quality. The most important groups of insects are listed on the slide, all of which include species dependent upon freshwater ecosystems for some portion of their life cycles. For some groups like mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies, and dragonflies, essentially all species rely on fresh waters, and together these include nearly 30,000 different species. And of course there are fish, which are considered to be of highest direct value to people across the world. About 15,000 species of freshwater fish have been identified, including those inhabiting the mouths of rivers and estuarine systems. Many fish are carnivores and others are detritivores, meaning that they feed on accumulated dead organic matter collected in river channels. We'll spend more time focused on fish and their needs in the next lecture. Virtually all river fish rely on multiple habitats in rivers and streams that change with season and flow regime. Like many fish, reptiles and amphibians are generally carnivores, but some are also omnivores. Reptiles found in fresh waters include turtles, snakes, and crocodiles. They have specific preferences for slow or fast-moving waters and also rely on healthy riparian habitats. Amphibians include salamanders, newts, toads, and frogs that are generally short-lived and develop as larvae in water. They're generally predators feeding on insects and crustaceans. And then there are the birds, and especially the waterfowl that depend on freshwater ecosystems. There are many species of waterfowl and many more species of birds that live in riparian corridors and feed primarily on adult stages of aquatic insects. Fish and amphibians are also common prey. Species of dippers and ducks dive beneath the water and hunt or forage along the river bottom. Let's have a look at one of these. The American Dipper doesn't necessarily look like a water bird, but it's especially adapted to feeding on aquatic insects. It has an extra eyelid to be able to see under the water. It's able to close its nostrils, and it's an excellent swimmer. See it in action on the YouTube video that I've posted in the additional resources section. Finally, we must not forget the mammals inhabiting freshwater ecosystems. Often, these are the most charismatic of the freshwater species appreciated by humans. Many mammals inhabit riparian corridors, and many more regularly visit rivers to drink. Species that actually spend most of their time in the water include beaver, 
otters, hippopotamus, and dolphins. Beavers and hippos are well-known animal engineers that may strongly modify river environments by felling riparian trees and building wood dams, as in the case of the beaver, or by creating pools and cutting large gullies through riparian areas, as is the case of the hippos. Hippos also feed outside rivers in adjoining grasslands. They feed at night and return to the river during the day. Uh, while in the river, they, um, let's just say, they expel large amounts of partially digested terrestrial plant material to rivers. This further increases the basal food supply. As I presented the different forms of life in river corridors, I also noted some of the relationships between them. There are many ways that different species interact, including competition for resources and habitats, symbioses to benefit both species, and of course, feeding linkages. I mostly mention these, who's eating whom. Feeding is essentially an exchange of energy and a distribution of the sun's energy captured by primary producers to other species higher in food chains. You may remember food chains from your earlier studies, but in nature, individual chains interact to form more complicated food webs, as shown on the slide. The different levels in a food chain are referred to as trophic levels. So again, the basal source of energy in foods webs comes from primary producers or plants growing within or near rivers. The energy stored in plant tissue is broken down physically and consumed mainly by insects and microorganisms. Insects also feed on the microorganisms decomposing plant material. Insects are then consumed by larger predators, which may be larger insects or vertebrates like fish. Upon death, the tissues of animals are physically and chemically decomposed in a manner similar to that of plant materials, returning nutrients to the system to be used again. The interactions within food webs vary in space and time within rivers. Some life stages of organisms, especially the younger ones, are focused on feeding and growth. During these periods of enhanced interaction among species, it's essential that all needed habitats characterized by depth, velocity, wetted width, and substrate are available. With such a diversity of species and related needs, you can imagine the importance of maintaining multiple components of a river's flow regime. And we must not forget the longitudinal or upstream-downstream connections in river corridors. River ecologists refer to the river continuum when describing the changes in basal energy sources along river systems and the influence this has on the community uh, composition and structure of higher trophic levels. As shown in the diagram on this slide, headwater sections of rivers are dominated by smaller shaded streams where the leaves and other parts of riparian plants are the dominant source of basal energy. Insects that feed by shredding leaves, the so-called shredders, or collecting the shredded material are therefore important components of the insect community. Grazers, which feed primarily uh, on algae within the stream, are a small component of the community because algae production is limited in the shaded conditions of headwater streams. Further downstream, rivers become wider and sunlight filters through the relatively clear water to support in-stream algae growth. Here, the grazing component of the insect community becomes more prominent and leaf-dependent shredders become only a small part of the community. Collectors are still significant as they're feeding on all forms of particulate matter and fine particulate matter in particular that's being transported by the flowing river. Finally, in the lower reaches of rivers, which often become deeper and more turbid, collectors dominate because the main source of basal energy is fine particulate organic matter transported from upstream. Well, this is, of course, an idealized concept of rivers, and there's great variety in individual rivers around the world. But it reminds us of the importance of maintaining upstream-downstream connections in our management of rivers because communities of organisms at any point in the river may be more or less dependent on upstream processes. The importance of connectivity also extends laterally from the rivers and streams to their riparian zones and floodplains. I'll say more about this in the next lecture, but for the moment, let's remain focused on sources of food or energy and look at the findings of this interesting study from Japan. 
Shigeru Nakano and Masashi Murakami spent more than a year monitoring the prey of fish and birds in Horonai Stream. What they found is that birds and fish consume a mixture of terrestrial and aquatic prey. In this figure, the black lines show the connections between predator and prey, and the thickness of the line represents the amount of each prey consumed. Terrestrial prey was generally more important in the diet of birds, but all species also consumed aquatic prey, and wrens, shown at the bottom left, depended mostly on aquatic prey. The most abundant fish species, trout and char, consumed nearly equal amounts of aquatic and terrestrial prey, which fell into the stream or were deposited or transported in uh, with runoff waters. So, what are the take-home messages from this lecture? We learned that life in river corridors consists of a great diversity of plants and animals occupying different habitats and different trophic levels in riverine food webs. We discussed algae, paraphyte, and macrophytes, and riparian plants, bacteria and fungi, mollusks, crustaceans, insects, fish, reptiles and amphibians, and mammals. We learned that primary producers capture and store the sun's energy and organic matter transferred to higher trophic levels by feeding, and aquatic communities vary in composition depending upon the sources of basal energy and physical variables. This variation changes along a continuum extending from headwaters to the mouth of the river. And finally, we learned that connectivity in the flows of energy longitudinally and laterally are important for biological communities throughout the river corridor. We'll discuss the importance of this connectivity in more detail during the next lecture. But that's the end of this lecture. Thanks very much.